believe it or not, Diana, not much in common with what I'm doing today. You know, there's always a first time. I should have it timed out, though, when you're doing the, the, the young people's moments, you know, to just kind of kick back and relax because, you know, I know you'll get a, the job done and I don't have to worry about it too much, right? <laughs> so reading from the 12th chapter of Luke, verses 13 to 31, let us reflect together on God's word. One of the multitudes said to him, teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me. You just heard this, right? Yeah. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or divider or to you? And he said to all of them. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich landowner produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I don't have any place to store all my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down every my barns and build bigger ones, and then I will store all my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, Self, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek God's kingdom, and all those things will be given to you as well. This is the word of the Lord. Be so, several years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Fritz. Does anybody know who Fritz is in American culture? Anybody? Fritz is Walter Mondale, the Vice President of the United States under Jimmy Carter. Everybody called him Fritz. And he was the presidential candidate against Ronald Reagan in, 19, in, in uh, 1984. And where I met Fritz was at a synagogue in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Fritz was to receive what the temple that night called its Zodic Award. Now what a Zodic is, is a rabbi in Hasidic Judaism whose primary job is to care for and suffer for his people. And so the Zodic Award, that's T-Z-A-D-D-I-K, except Hebrew doesn't have vowels, so I guess you have to take out the A and the I. Uh, the Zodic Award was a special award given to Fritz for his special sacrifice in community service. Now, as, um, local and, and as a local pastor at the time, and as a colleague of Rabbi Marcy, who was uh, 
had been the head lead rabbi at that temple for 25 years, a fascinating woman. Um, and uh, she invited me to come, as well as other members of our Interfaith Ministerial Alliance, to, to come to this Zodic Award. So I went. And, and I personally heard stories at the time where Fritz, Walter Mondale, was a mediator between Rabbi Marcy and Pastor Tim of the Presbyterian Church when they got into a big fight over Palestinian Jewish relations. They, Walter came in, Fritz came in, and helped settle, settle the conflict between the two, which was just fascinating. I really wish I could have been a mouse in that room. So at any rate, I got to meet Fritz that night. And at another meeting of that ministerial group, I got to meet Governor Mark Dayton, who was the governor of Minnesota at the time. But you know what? My guess is, is that within 30 years, since none of you who knew Fritz was anyway, within another 30 years, hardly anybody is going to remember Fritz or Governor Dayton except for historians who will mark them probably best and most as a footnote in history. And if we really look at ourselves in our own contexts, it raises the question, who will remember us? Who will remember us a few days, a few decades after our souls pass from this earth? Our children will. And if you have them, siblings and grandchildren, and, and a few friends here and there, but as time passes, the memories and the legacies fade. Usually, in the month of March, I remember my friend Kenny, who was my roommate during my first year of grad school, and Kenny that year died of melanoma cancer. And usually, it, during March, and that was some some 40 some odd years ago. Usually during the month of March, I'll remember Kenny and lift him up. But I don't do it every year. I've got pictures on the wall of my bedroom. One is an article from the 1936 edition of the Daily Oklahoma, which was the Oklahoma City paper. And it talks about my grandfather. It was the front page edition. It talks about my grandfather who was prosecuting attorney for Okmulgee County at that time, Okmulgee County, Oklahoma. And, the, and, and it gave great detail about his life because he had gone after and put in jail a lot of the gang members, think Dillinger and, and uh, you know, Ma Barker and that sort, those type of people. He got a lot of those people put in jail down in Oklahoma. The other portrait that I have is a, is, is a family portrait my brother did. Of, who's a, he's a, an artist. And he did it of all the bright males at the time. It's about 25 years ago. And it was my grandfather and my father and my uncle and my brother and I. And that, those two helped me to remember my grandparents. But do I do that all the time? No. Beyond that, the only pieces of my family folklore that I'm aware of and that were passed down to me were the fact that my great-grandmother was thought probably a full-blooded Chickasha, Chickasha Indian, and that my great-great-grandfather had a second cousin he used to go hunting with, a guy by the name of Daniel Boone. Generations pass. The memories fade. And who will be, we be remembered by? That brings up the matter of our legacies, because what is a legacy? It's a way of being remembered. And now I hope to be remembered as a repentant servanthood soul, as pastor who was a devoted friend and lover of humanity. But who knows? My kids will remember me in some ways good and in some ways bad. They remember their grandparents in similar ways as well. Presidents and royalty and musicians and sports stars sometimes have lengthy legacies. Of course, some people are also remembered as being 
Here, we, we, we come together with your, your, your children's servant. They are remembered as being greedy souls who cared little for others or political leaders who destroyed cultures. One wondered whether they took lessons on how to be a jerk or whether it just came naturally. One of the things we'll be working on in the country in the coming months here at First Christian will be a legacy piece for members of the congregation. Barbara Bobbitt attended a workshop on legacy at the General Assembly. It was done by the Christian Church Foundation. And I hope that in a few months, either in the fall or in the spring, we certainly don't schedule it for winter around here, uh, we'll hopefully have a, a workshop with Jerry Lang of the Christian Church Foundation, uh, who, who will come up from Denver and lead us in a presentation of, how, of legacies and how they work in the life of the church. And I hope you'll be able to attend at that time. The question of legacy and remembrance comes up in our scripture lesson for this morning. It's a parable about a man who had it good. Jesus starts and says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a person's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he tells a story about a rich farmer had a good year of crops to the point that all of his storage facilities were full and the cop, crop was poured over onto the ground. I, I remember a few years where I lived in Winterset, Iowa, which is the heart of Iowa corn country, and the crops overflowed, and corn was piled in mounds 25 feet high outside of the elevators. Incredible. This rich landowner in the scripture lesson thought, what shall I do with all this bounty? Oh, I know. I'll tear down my barn and I'll build bigger ones. And when all this is done, I'm going to lay back and celebrate and have a good time. The passage is actually where the phrase eat, drink, and be merry comes from, by the way. But God speaks to the man. And he says, you're a fool. You're going to die tonight. And what good will all your plans and bounty do for you then? And the, then the passage goes on with instructions to the disciples about how to be rich for God and not worry about the material possessions. That's hard to do though, isn't it? We like our security. We like our comforts. We like our, our uh, iPads and iPods and, and cell phones and giant big screen TVs and, you know. Jesus tells us, don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry about what you eat. That's a tough one. I worry about what I'm going to make every night. Don't worry about what you wear, for God adorns the flowers of the field and raiment richer than that of King Solomon. Don't worry about what you're to eat or drink, for God will take care of these. But seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and then all those things will be added to you as well. That's why we're here in church, my brothers and sisters, to seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness that we can trust in the other things being added. And I encourage us to spend some time, a good amount of time, in prayer and meditation and reflection. I got an email from a church I used to serve this week, and, and they are going to try to spend the next six weeks envisioning what God wants them to do and who God wants them to be as a congregation. They're going to pray about it. They're going to make a list. They'll be putting thoughts on a vision board in the sanctuary. And you may think, oh, we've done that. Or we've done stuff like that. But the job of church is to continually look at ourselves and envision what God's will might be for the congregation's future. That's why we had the sermon forums and other congregational conversations over the time that I've been here. And why we'll probably have a few more before I leave. 
And my guess is that whoever succeeds me will want to do the same whenever that time comes. We pastors like to mess around and take surveys and find, figure out who y'all are. We dream dreams together. We have visions. And then the toughest part, we work at turning those visions into reality. And if they're deemed from God, they'll become reality. Lots of good things from God come through having dreams and visions. Trusting. Really trusting in God, that's the hard part, isn't it? It's been, I've been having some really good arguments with God over recent weeks. Well, I argue she mostly laughs. But it is in wrestling with God to get a sense from God of the divine will and way. That's what makes holy things happening. The surprises that can bring us joy and challenge and new mission and growth and hope for the future. So, you see, if we're to leave this generation's legacy on the life of First Christian Church for future generations, if we're to look towards how we are to be remembered, it requires first trusting in God and being faithful and moving the body forward into the further into the 21st century. To be remembered, we have to build and dream and have visions and turn visions into reality. God will certainly celebrate that. Amen. The whole point of a worship service is to point towards a particular item in that worship service, and in our case, in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, it's Holy Communion. 